Color can be one of the most difficult aspects of art to grasp. Not only does it relate to the overall cohesion and appeal of your piece, but color also plays a huge part in what emotion is communicated. So in this video, I'm going to be sharing with you my knowledge of color theory so far and how you can start using color more effectively in your work. But before we get into that, I want to briefly mention that this video is sponsored by Skillshare. Follow the first link in the description to get a free trial of premium membership and dive deeper into art fundamentals. I'll have more on Skillshare after the video. Keep in mind that this video is just my understanding of color and light. And even though I have done my research and I've been doing art for a long time, I am still learning myself. So if you want to watch some other in-depth explanations of color theory, I'll have a couple of other videos linked in the description. And remember, when applying the principles I list in this video to your own work, keep an open mind and never stop learning. I've separated this video out into three sections just to make it a little bit easier to swallow. This is not for me. First up is color terminology. Let's begin by talking about hue. Uh, wait, okay, no, that's, that's not the right one. Oh, okay, that's better. Hue is probably the easiest term to understand. Hue is simply color independent of value, saturation, or contrast. In a digital space, if you drew a little splotch of blue and shifted the hue of the color, only the color would change. Notice the intensity and darkness stays the same. To get a bit nerdy and scientific about it, you can think of hue or local color of an object as the wavelength of light it reflects. Color that we can see with our eyes is the result of the visible light spectrum. So in a way you can think about color the same way you might think about light. If there is no light and things are rather dark, colors are unlikely to have a lot of intensity and saturation. However, if full on daylight is shining on an object, then the color is more likely to be highly saturated and bright. Now let's talk about saturation. Saturation is the intensity of the color. In a digital space, sliding around the saturation bar will either make colors very intense or quite faint. Sliding it until there isn't any saturation at all will result in a black and white or grayscale image. In a traditional space, desaturated colors can be created by mixing a color with gray. This is called a tone. This brings me to value. Value is the brightness or darkness of a color or hue. Remember, hue is just color, saturation is how intense the color is, and value is how light or dark it is. Value is best expressed as a scale, from dark to light. A good, intentional value scale can really make or break an illustration. If you're ever struggling with colors in an illustration or design, add a black and white filter to your drawing and see if you have good value variation. See if the lighting makes sense. Saturation can be really misleading when it comes to a value scale, so this is a really helpful trick. Once I started applying this in my own work, I noticed how much I overused saturated colors, so this really helped me to find a balance between saturated colors and a good scale of tones. And for those of you who are traditional artists, you can simply snap a photo with your phone and turn down the saturation that way. There are a lot of different ways to do this if you're resourceful. Of course, large and small value scales both have their merit. Which brings me to the next term, contrast. Contrast is the difference between the lightest and darkest values in your piece. Turning down the contrast in your image will result in less of a difference between the lights and darks in your piece, creating more tones. Turning up the contrast in your image will increase the difference between the lights and the darks until the result is a stark black and white image. The middle ground is where a full scale of values exists. This is typically what you're aiming for. Of course, you can just create art with large contrast or little contrast intentionally, only using lights and darks or mostly very similar tones. High contrast and low contrast scales can have really interesting effects on the mood of the piece. Keep in mind, the word contrast can mean a few different things in art. You can have contrasting colors like red and blue, contrasting textures, shapes, etc. But when it comes to color theory terminology, this is generally what contrast means. Now that we've discussed the main terms and their relationships to each other, I want to touch on how to apply these traditionally. Shades, tones, and tints are the terms commonly used for traditional artists mixing paint for the purpose of achieving this kind of color variation. As I mentioned before, to create a shade or a darker color, add black. To create a tone or a less saturated color, add gray. 
to create a tint or a lighter color, add white. And to get more saturated colors, you generally need to add more pigment. I keep some colored ink around in my workspace when acrylic painting for this purpose. Is it correct? Uh, probably not, but it works. If you wanna know more about mixing color traditionally, you can check out a video I have linked in the description on acrylic color mixing. This video has been an absolute lifesaver for me and it has wonderful information in it. Speaking of mixing colors, I'd be remiss if I didn't touch on color hierarchy. At least that's what I'm going to call it. These are the primary colors, secondary colors, and tertiary colors. These colors make up the main hues. Red, yellow, and blue, of course, make purple, orange, and green. And purple, orange, and green make yellow, orange, red, orange, red, purple, purple, blue, green, blue, yellow, green. You get it. It's a pyramid scheme of color. <laughs> So now that we've gotten a bit into color mixing, I've definitely gotten a little ahead of myself because to me, the next obvious step is to talk about the color wheel. The color wheel is arranged according to the colors relationships to each other. Color wheels can be really useful for choosing color schemes or color groups, which are essentially colors that have harmony or complement each other. Color wheels can also be arranged with color mixing and value in mind. Now let's talk about some color schemes. Monochromatic, analogous, complementary, split complementary, triad, tetrad, and square are all examples of some pretty classic schemes. Here's an example of a monochromatic color scheme. In a monochromatic scheme, one color creates tints, tones, and shades like we discussed before. It's basically just one color at different levels of saturation and value. You can create some pretty striking work with this scheme. Next, we've got analogous. Analogous colors are basically just colors that are right next to each other on the color wheel. For example, a color scheme of magenta, purple, and blue is analogous. Complementary color schemes are a very popular choice. Complementary colors are simply directly across from each other on the color wheel. It's important to remember that in most color schemes, not all colors should exist at the same level of saturation. Complementary color schemes tend to be a bit tricky for beginners because the color wheel says that green and red look good together, but at the same level of saturation, complementary colors can kind of be an eyesore. So I find that complementary schemes look best when one color is dominant and the other serves as an accent color. Split complementary, triad, tetrad, and square are all shape combinations on the color wheel that make different appealing schemes. I see split complementary as being kind of a combination of complementary and analogous. A triad is essentially any three colors that are separated by three colors on a traditional color wheel, and a tetrad or square is basically any four colors that make a square or rectangle shape. The rectangle shape can be separated by a varying amount of colors. There are definitely other color schemes that can be made that don't necessarily adhere to the wheel, but these are the fundamentals of the theory. Real quick, I wanted to touch on the digital color wheel. The digital color wheel, at least this particular one, has everything you need to paint and mix color according to color theory. Not only does it have a literal color wheel, but this inner square has every variety of color you could ever want. The outer ring is your hue. The upper right corner is the most saturated state of the hue. The inner square toward the middle is every tone of a hue. The top of the square is your tints. Bottom is the most saturated and most unsaturated state of the darkest value. The left side is the values or grayscale form of a color, and the right side is the shades. It took me a while to realize this, and maybe I'm just dumb, but this definitely helped me to begin choosing better colors when digital painting. Before we move on, I want to quickly touch on warm and cool colors. In relation to the color wheel, half the wheel is made up of warm colors and half is made up of cool ones. This is generally pretty easy to understand, but there are still warm cool colors and cool warm colors, like cool grays and French grays, or warm and cool pinks, blues, etc. Like we discussed before, contrast can also be created through warm and cool colors. However, my primary interest in warm and cool colors is how they impact the mood and emotion of a piece. This brings me to the third and final section of the video, color symbolism and emotional context. Color can be a powerful tool when conveying the emotional mood of a piece. Of course, a big part of how color conveys emotion is through cultural symbolism and context. For example, in Western and Eastern cultures, 
opposite colors represent death. You'll find that colors often take on double meanings depending on the time and context. Let's go over the basics. Red often represents passion, love, danger, fire, sincerity, power, and speed. Orange is known for energy, creativity, balance, enthusiasm, and warmth. Yellow can mean joy and happiness, betrayal, optimism, hope, philosophy, and dishonesty. I think it's really interesting that yellow can mean happiness and dishonesty at the same time. Green usually means nature, health, youth, fertility, envy, good luck, villainy, and misfortune. Blue can mean peace, calm, cold, harmony, order, loyalty, sky, and water. Purple can mean royalty, nobility, spirituality, mystery, wisdom, cruelty, honor, and arrogance. Pink slash magenta can mean love and romance, caring, acceptance, and calm. Black can mean power, sexuality, sophistication, wealth, depth, fear, and death in Western cultures. And white can mean purity, simplicity, peace, innocence, snow, cold, and death in Eastern cultures. Works of fiction can create new contexts for color through characterization and world building. For example, when characterized in a certain way, blue can convey even more anger than red. Take Azula's fire in Avatar The Last Airbender, for instance. Her blue fire represented a cold, passionless anger that fits her character perfectly. I find that color can be underutilized in a lot of people's work, including my own. So while I talk about this portion of the video, I'm going to be redrawing the same small illustration using three different color schemes to illustrate how it alters the mood. The emotional context is supposed to be angry. Once I'm done, we'll take a guess at which scheme conveys anger the best. For the sake of keeping things simple, I'm using some fairly analogous color schemes here of red purple, blue cyan, and pink orange. This is pretty elementary, but obviously the red purple color combination conveys anger the best. But of course, in a certain context, the blue cyan combination could be a mournful anger, and the pink orange combination could be an energetic, passionate anger. In a storytelling situation, the scene and characterization can recontextualize the color you use in your piece. Colors that might symbolize one thing in our society might mean something entirely different for your character. And of course, in the end, you can't ignore the fact that color and interpretation of art is subjective. So each new viewer might extrapolate a different meaning from the colors of your piece. In the end, color theory, color symbolism, whatever, are all just principles that can help you to understand the relationships colors have to each other and how to start using them more effectively. But as with all rules in art, once you know them, they are made to be broken. After learning and practicing the color fundamentals, color can be a very intuitive part of the art process. So don't be afraid to take some risks and try some schemes that go against the rules I laid out in this video. I'd like to make another one to two videos in this series that explores how creators I love use color and how it enriches the storytelling in their work. This would be a pretty large undertaking, so let me know if that's something you guys would be interested in. Until then, I hope you all found this helpful and learned something. If you have any other questions, feel free to leave them in the comment section down below. In the meantime... Uh, ooh, what, what's this? What's this, lads? It's an ad! <laughs> if you're interested in learning more about the topic of color theory, you can do that with this video's sponsor, Skillshare. Skillshare is a huge online learning community that offers thousands of classes in illustration, design, video, freelancing, and much more. Skillshare classes can help you to grow your existing passions, become curious about new ones, and stay inspired with their creative atmosphere. With Skillshare, you can have fun learning on your own schedule. It's ad-free and you can take classes on everything from art fundamentals to sketchbooking and journaling to video editing and creation all with convenient and easy to digest classes that average at about 60 minutes and difficulty levels that you can grow into. And Skillshare's annual subscription gives you access to their entire library for less than $10 a month. Skillshare is offering the first 1,000 people who join using my link in the description a free trial of premium membership so that you can explore their classes and get inspired. Speaking of which, a class that I've taken a recent interest in is Intro to Graphic Design, Expressing Emotion with Color Theory by Dominic Flask. It's a great color theory course about how to convey emotion using color with a focus on graphic design. Since the course focuses on the graphic design, design applications of color, Dominic walks you through the process of choosing a palette to 
deliberately communicate the emotional context of your piece. He also goes a bit into color symbolism, which is a super fascinating subject. Since a big part of art is about communicating ideas and emotions, I find Dominic's lessons to be super useful, especially since I'm very interested in making a full color comic someday. You can watch this class for free on Skillshare whenever you join using my link in the description down below and get your free trial of premium membership. I think that this class makes a wonderful follow-up to this video and it dives just a little bit deeper into the subject of color theory. Thank you once again to Skillshare for sponsoring the channel. Please go check them out. They're a great service and when you do so, it helps out the channel tremendously. Yes, I do. I mean, of course I do. Then why haven't you talked about me? Why? It's what people want. Okay, I'll do it. Just leave. Please. I said leave. You're still here? Why? It's over. Go home.